Our next speaker is Mr. Jean, Gary Jean Ulp, and he's going to be speaking about building and living in harmony with the planet. He's an environmental architect. He knows a lot about sustainable approaches to architecture, mandates that we begin to think. Let me get my glasses. We, th that we begin to think about how, to, how a project introspective of its size may impact conditions elsewhere on the globe or future generations. Please help me welcome Gary Jean Ulp. Can somebody hold up five fingers when there's like five minutes left? Okay, great. Well, thanks, uh, thanks for coming in and listening. I'm going to talk a little bit about green building and uh, the impact that uh, buildings actually have on our environment. Most people don't think that buildings have an impact. How, do they, how can they have an impact on air quality or, or an impact on the environment and so on? And really, that's, that's not true. If you begin to think about, about what happens in the construction of a building, what happens when you occupy a building and so on, the circumstances are pretty severe. A good example is how many uh, folks in here have ever been to Mesa Verde up in the Four Corners area of Colorado? Uh, it's the Chaco Canyon culture, which was uh, uh, the Anasazi culture, but they're giving those people a different name. Anasazi just means the ancient ones. Uh, but they were the Native Americans who lived in the Four Corners area uh, about 1,500, 2,000 years ago. If you go there today, most people that go there, what you see is you see the desert. You see, you know, pinyon pines. You see... Uh, juniper berries, uh, juniper trees, you see desert cactus, grasses, those sorts of things, a lot of rock, a lot of sand. Well, what's true is human impact has had such terrible impact on this planet, primarily from building, building buildings to support our standard of life and our culture. Well, 2,000 years ago, that area was a rainforest. It looked a lot like the area around Seattle, Washington. Thick trees, lots of precipitation, it was a wonderful area because Carlsbad Cavern sits underneath there. The only way Carlsbad Caverns can be there is because the calcium carbonate that leached through the soil from the rainforest that once was there. Well, what happened was that Chaco Canyon culture was so successful that they continued to cut down the forest to clear more land to plant squash, beans, potatoes, you know, not potatoes, I mean, not pumpkins, those sorts of things, maize. And they kept cutting down the timber for, to, build a, to build the structures. And for a long time, and I still believe that I still, I still uh, use it in my slideshows as an example, Chaco Canyon culture was successful because they built with natural materials. They found these wonderful cliffs that were south facing so that they would build out of the local stone and mud and, and they would actually build these wonderful adobe like structures out of rock. Those structures would absorb the sun's energy all day long in the wintertime so it kept the interiors very nice and warm. In the summertime what happened is the cliffs overhung those dwellings just enough that they were always in shade during the day. So even though it would be 120 degrees outside, those dwellings would stay very cool and comfortable. They literally could trap the water that came down the rocks and they'd hold it in cisterns. So it's a marvelous example of how we as a species were able to use natural materials and create this wonderful architecture that just supported this population bloom. Well, as that population grew, they virtually ate the landscape to a desert. That's such a sensitive climate that that desert exists today, almost 1,500 years later. If you get a chance, go down to Big Bend, all of Central Texas. I think most folks have driven around Austin, San Antonio, the Hill Country. And you look at that and you wonder, why in the world did ranchers come to Central Texas? All this juniper, prickly pear, all this nasty stuff. How can cows even find something to eat here? Well, what's true is, as little as 150 years ago, the grass in Central Texas was taller than the horse on his shoulder on a horse's shoulder. The grass was that tall. That's why the ranchers settled there and that's why the ranchers built cattle ranches there because the grass was so abundant. Well, what happened was we as species, we bring in cattle, we put too many cows per acre on that land and the cows literally ate the native grasses down to just the nub. What happened is that when those prairies were there, the natural buffalo and antelope and so on, their hooves would cut up, cut up the rhizomes. Grass grows by growing underneath the soil. It would cut those rhizomes up they poop, fertilize, mix it into the soil, and they, they tended to graze in paddocks, which were very tight packs of animals because the predators would keep them very tight. And then they would move to the next area. So whenever those buffalo and the antelope and so on would move around, whenever they came back, they had this wonderful grass to come back to. Well, now it's been overgrazed. Cattle are good at compacting the land, not so good at breaking it up. And all the native grass has been killed off. And what you see there today are invasive species. 
The junipers are invasive species. The prickly pear are invasive species. They've come in, they've populated and destroyed Central Texas because of the hand of man, because of things, the impact we've had. A lot of ranchers in Central Texas now are actually going in, pulling out all those junipers, ripping them out, burning them, things like that. The native grasses are coming back. Not only that, but springs and artesian wells that were talked about 150 years ago. These ranchers said their grandfathers talked about the artesian wells and the water that was present on the ranch. They haven't seen water in 100 years. Those artesian wells are coming back. Because now, when you get rid of the junipers, you let the native species come back, the ground absorbs the water, and it lets the springs, it lets the aquifers fill and the springs fill. So we do have an impact. We have a tremendous impact we don't think about. Everyone here has, I'm sure, read the Bible, and you've read about what the Middle East, between the Euphrates and the Tigris, looked like at the time of Christ. It was a ver veritable, it was a jungle. It was a rainforest. It's called a breadbasket because seven of the grains we eat today grew there nowhere else in the planet. Not a single place elsewhere in the planet. That's where wheat came from, why came from, barley came from there. Seven of the grains we ate today were from there. They grew nowhere else on the planet. We as a human species harvested those grains. We learned how to farm. Agriculture was born there, how to plant them, grow bigger grains. So ultimately what happened was the Middle East, just like the Chaco Canyon culture at the time of Christ, our population, the human species, bloomed there. I mean, it just, we just, population just exploded. And what did they do? They built cities. They built buildings. Look at all the cities in the Bible. How many are, how many are talked about? And if you read anything about the history of the Middle East, I mean, there were cities everywhere. It was a booming population. Again, we as a species built and ate our way through that environment, and we turned it into the pictures you see today. When you see pictures from Iraq and Iran, and you see this desert. It wasn't like that at the time of Christ. It had abundant rainfall. It was a rainforest, but it's a very sensitive environment. But because we overbuilt it, overgrazed it, overfarmed it, we, turn, we, we literally changed the weather pattern to what you see today. So we do have an impact. When we look at our cities and you think about what was here in the Metroplex at one time. I mean, you had native grasses. You had, this was a grassland prairie. Well, now you have buildings after building after building. You have pavement, pavement, pavement. One of the things that, that we do in my practice, it's called... It's called the LEED rating system. It's the United States Green Building Council Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It's a rating system and a certification for buildings that says these buildings outperform conventional construction. In, those, in the rating system, you deal with things like water, trash, all those sorts of things. One of the big categories in the LEED rating system is called the heat island effect. And that's when you, you go out there and you build all these buildings, sidewalks, roofs, driveways, all this incredible amount of building, and you've taken away the natural services, the regional temperature increases by 15 degrees. So if you look at the average temperature in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex since, say, 1930, go back to 1930 and look at the average temperatures then, look at the temperatures now in the summertime, we're 15 degrees hotter. It was not 110 degrees in the summertime in Dallas in 1930. But again, we've done that because of the way we build. The other thing that's interesting is water use. You look at everybody says, oh, the Delft Metroplex is so humid in the summertime. Again, go back to 1930 and look at the weather data. Dallas-Fort Worth was not a humid place. The climate here was beautiful. That's why people settled here. It was a great place to live. It's more humid now than it was in 1930. Well, you have to ask yourself, well, why in the heck is that? How can it be more humid than it was? No, these trees weren't here. This was all grassland. There weren't any trees. But we've been aggressive. Now, there's nothing wrong with trees. Trees do a lot of good things. But aggressively, we planted trees, which tend to hold moisture, create evapotranspiration. If you want to find an interesting uh, tidbit, Google evapotranspiration and look at the rates that different trees absorb water out of the soil. In the summertime, it will blow your mind. A 36-inch oak tree will expel something like 10,000 gallons of water in the atmosphere in a day's time. It's just incredible how much water those roots draw to your trees. So you get all these foundation engineers that say cut down trees that are near a foundation because it's making it move. Part of that's hokey pokey. But, but the deal is trees do draw moisture out of the soil and they evaporate it. The good thing about trees is they do sequester carbon. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So the lead rating system looks at all those little things. So when, when I talk about how buildings infect, affect the environment, you have to think differently about buildings. For instance, the toaster in your home, your average toaster, that generates 500 pounds of CO2. A shower, the shower in your home, generates 1,500 pounds, almost a ton of carbon dioxide a year. Well, it's not the shower, and it's not the toaster. It's back at the power plant where we're burning fossil fuels. We're burning coal, natural gas, 
uh, petroleum, those kind of things. And we're burning that at the power plant. We're generating CO2 and putting it in the atmosphere. What also goes in the atmosphere besides CO2 is nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxides, particulates, carbon monoxide, and a whole host of other things you really don't want to know about, mercury, lead, all those kind of things. So when you think about buildings polluting the air, they really do because a building that's wasteful does pollute. Most of our commercial buildings that we build are 50 to 65 percent more energy efficient than a conventional building. So if you look at all the conventional buildings, or in fact, a good example is like your glass office towers. The buildings that we do are almost 80 percent more efficient, commercial buildings, than a glass office tower. When you look at our buildings, the way we build, it's kind of like that Pat Summerall commercial where we used to say, it's 72 degrees all across America. Well, that always drives me nuts because here in Dallas, you go through any, go through any commercial office building and you're going to find women sitting there in sweaters and pants and, and, and heavy clothes on and the guy around the corner, if he could get down to his boxer shorts, would do it. And that's typical any time of the year. It doesn't matter what you wear. You can wear the same thing in Dallas in July that you wear in December when you're in that building. And that's because that building has been poorly designed, stupidly designed, because it doesn't interact with the regional climate. So what's true is that building is, gen is ha having to use energy to cool it when it doesn't need cooling. It's having to generate heat to heat it when it doesn't need heating. And we're burning this stuff. I mean, we're, you know, we're in this conflict in the Middle East, and we're trying to settle that all down. And, you know, this side saying it's not about the oil, and it's about democracy, and this side says it's about something else. Well, what's true is we still need a lot of Middle Eastern oil because as a, as a culture, as a country, we consume one-third of the petroleum that's extracted from the planet. One-third. And we only represent, I think right now the figure's down, we represent about 15% of the world's population. And yet we consume from the Middle East, just the Middle East, we, we use, I think we're... I think we consume, I think it's somewhere around 60% of the oil generated in the middle, produced in the Middle East. So when you think about that, when you think about buildings that are wasting 90, when they're using 90% more energy than they really need, we're, it, you know, the, socio, the sociopolitical consequences are severe, but go back to the power plant. If we're burning 90% more stuff than we need to burn, and we're dumping 90% more CO2, NOx, SOx, all those things in the atmosphere, it's crazy. We design homes in my practice. We design homes in Dallas, Fort Worth that don't have any air conditioning. They have no heating and no cooling systems. Now, I take the special client. I mean, it takes a client who, who you know, it's 105 degrees outside. They don't mind it if the house is 83 or 84 and they'll have the fans on and they'll sit down, you know, in shorts and a t-shirt. Not every one of my clients enjoys that. But I have a fair amount of clients who come to me and they're willing to live like that. They're willing to have screen porches. The wintertime, you know, they like to put, you know, they'll put their sweaters on. They'll put their, their you know, their wool, their wool slippers on and those kind of things. And they'll live in a home uh, more in, in tune to the climate. And they, you know, they talk about wellness. They feel better. They're not as sick. They don't have allergy problems. All the things that you hear about from people, they don't get sinus infections. Because they're living closer to what the natural climate is. As compared to people who go into high-rise towers that are 68 or 70 degrees all day, and then they walk outside that door and it's 105 or 110 degrees outside in Dallas. So there is something about being more acclimated. But those clients can live in those conditions. I have other clients who say, well, I just want to use as little air conditioning as I can because I still like some air conditioning. So on average, most of our residential work, are, the homes are 95% more energy efficient. To give you a good example, my home that I finished about a year and a half ago, it's 3,600 square feet. The highest bill I paid for cooling last August, $65. This winter, I had nothing for heating bills, nothing, zero. Didn't need any heating because my house is passive solar. It's designed to react with the environment. I open the windows. You talk about health, building health. Buildings affect your health all day long. Another example, how many of you sit in conference rooms that don't have any windows and just fluorescent light? How do you feel after you've been in there about an hour or two? You get sleepy, your eyes, you sit there and it's like, you know, you're trying to wake up. It's because as human beings, we evolved with diurnal cycle of, of natural light. We need full spectrum daylighting. We need to have the lighting move around. They've done, they've done studies with, uh, scientists have done studies with kids, and they've discovered that children in classrooms without natural daylight perform almost 30% less on test scores than children who are in buildings with natural light. That's how big of an impact. Now, that doesn't even begin to talk about fresh air, which is another aspect of wellness and health in buildings, is that we need to think a bit differently about fresh air, how we bring fresh air into that building, how much fresh air is brought into that building. Is there enough? Is it, what's the quality of that fresh air? 
this rush to create energy efficient buildings that, that the National Home Builder Association and a number of other agencies have done was essentially to wrap a building as tight as you could, seal it up so it didn't leak, didn't leak any air. Well, what, what that is, is that's sort of like the diaper pail syndrome. You know, if you put something in a diaper pail and you seal it up, what does it smell like in there? It gets pretty bad. Well, that's what they do with buildings. I mean, that's the strategy. It's not about letting a building breathe. It's not about letting a building work with the sun and shading out the, the hot summer sun and letting the winter sun in. It's all about just wrapping it in a baggie, sealing it up, and trying to keep the energy in. Well, when you've got people living inside of there, breathing inside of there, what do you think happens? We absorb all those toxins. Another big part of what we do with the lead rating system and our home design is we, we really pay a lot of attention to the volatile organic compounds, chemical concentrations in your home. If you don't think that has an impact, there are a number of studies, and there's, there's even some that I've written that are on the web, where they looked at the average American home. Scientists, the EPA actually did the study. I think they studied uh, 15,000 American homes. And what they looked at was the chemical concentration in the homes. The facts are staggering. They found that in the average American home, the chemical, con chemical concentrations, the very chemicals that we're paying billions to eradicate from Superfund sites exist in the average American home in concentrations 10 to 100 times greater than at the Superfund sites. We're talking about benzenes, two lanes, nasty stuff, formaldehyde, all these chemicals. Where are they coming from? Where, are this, where is this stuff coming from? Well, you know those yard pesticide companies? They're the worst because they have found chloridine, which has been banned since the late 60s, and DDT. They still find it in homes. There's no ultraviolet degradation in most American homes. So those chemicals just linger. They just linger in the house. Dry cleaning, carbon tetrachloride. If you take, you know, there are cleaners now that don't use carbon tetrachloride, and I'd encourage you to find some that don't use carbon tet to clean your clothes. But when you bring those dry, that dry cleaning in, they're full of carbon tetrachloride. Where does it go? It off gases into your home. You can hang your cleaning out in a garage or an outside linen cabinet or something like that to let them air for a few days. And after about th three days, the carbon tet will, will volatize and it'll be gone. But that's a big problem. In America, we have used formaldehyde ubiquitously. We, in every adhesive, every cabinet, every uh, particle board, plywood, stains, varnishes, it was everywhere. The building industry is really getting good now about weaning that sort of stuff out of chemical compounds that we use in our home. So when you go, if you're going to repaint your home, go to Sherwin-Williams and ask them for their Harmony paint. It has no VOC and it has no smell. And what a funny story about that was when I was finishing my home, my painter, I told him I wanted to use this Harmony paint that it had no VOCs in it. He said, well, I'm not going to warranty that paint. I said, why not? It's sold by Sherwin-Williams. He goes, I'm not going to warranty it. It's, you know, it's, it's not what I normally use. He said, because uh, if it doesn't work, then you're going to have me back your paint. I said, don't worry about it. I'll waive your warranty. If I buy it, will you put it up? Well, sure, I'll do that. So I bought the Harmony paint. So he was in there, painted the house. About four days later, I met, ran into him to, for his check, and he said, you know, he said, he said, that stuff is great. He said, there's something really different about it. And I said, what's that? And he said, it doesn't smell. He said, it's great. We don't get any headaches when we're in here painting. I said, well, that's what I'm telling you, because it has no volatile organic compounds. So he says, yeah, this is great stuff. So about two weeks later, he came back to do some touch-up, and he goes, hey, i got to tell you, I've been in Highland Park, and I sold five jobs on this healthy paint. And I, said, I said, that's great, that's great. He goes, and I charged him more. And I said, no, no, that's not right. You don't need to do that. But, but that's the, the choices are out there. So if you're going to repaint your home, ask the paint supplier. Home Depot has them, Lowe's has them, Sherwin-Williams has them. Ask them for no VOC or low VOC paint. You could also buy recycled paint, where they take old paint and they mix it, and you've got about eight or ten colors. They're usually khakis and greens and so on. But the trouble with those is, while it's wonderful that we're recycling that paint, those paints are still full of volatile organic compounds. So you're better off buying paints that have no VOCs. You know, choose acrylic sealers, choose acrylic stains versus oil-based stains. Now, it is true that there are some woods that, that will take an oil stain better than an acrylic stain because basically wood and oil don't mix and wood's full of oil. I mean, it has, a na it has natural laws. It's where turpentine comes from. It comes from pine. But you can do things like you can do finishing operations outside. Part of that lead rating system that I talked to you about is, is it's all about eliminating toxic intrusion into the interior environment. Look at your cleaning compounds. You know, again, there's, and I think there's somebody here too that has, has natural cleaning compounds. We did a study where we looked at, um, we did a green building and so one of the first uh, lead rating systems we went after, we were involved in the prior program, we said, 
you know what, we'd like you to stop using chemical cleaning compounds in your building because it'll have an impact on the health of your employees that work in this building. And it took a little bit of a sale because they didn't quite believe us. But then we talked about using, you know, lemon juices and, and vinegars and, you know, natural cleaning compounds and getting rid of all the other chemical stuff. Well, they did that and their employees love it. There's no lingering cleaning smell the next morning after the folks have been in there cleaning. You can buy carpets that, are, that carry the green guard seal that don't off gas. And a good company is Interface Carpeting. Interface Carpeting, and there's a great book called Mid-Course Correction. If you want to read that book, it's wonderful. Mid-Course Correction talks about how the Interface Carpet Company wants to be able to recycle every square foot of carpet that they make and make new carpet fiber and backing from the old carpet that they've already made. They don't believe anybody should own carpet because if you buy carpet, it's nuts because ultimately you're going to pull it up and it's going to go to the landfill. Did you know that 60% of the volume of landfills is carpeting? And the stuff, the half-life on carpeting is like hundreds of thousands of years. It just doesn't break down. So he's doing a wonderful thing with that, with interface carpet. So when we select carpet, now that he's had some copycats, there's Shaw and there's a few others uh, that are also doing the same thing. Some manufacturers even push that even further and they're making carpeting out of cornstarch and soy so that it'll, it'll naturally decompose. And the goal is that carpeting and fabrics, all fabrics, fabrics on chairs, fabrics on couches, fat draperies, carpeting, that you'll be able to take that and throw it in a compost pile and have it decompose. And what I'm talking about, you know, with buildings, it's called, it's called the industrial, it's sort of the second industrial revolution. If you, you can Google that and you can kind of find some good information about it. And it talks about closing the loop. Buildings are a big part of that, closing the loop. Natural systems close the loop. In the natu in natural environment, waste equals food. Nothing leaves that cycle. Energy comes in from the sun, it has some water, but nothing leaves. Waste equals food. We as a species have been an extractive species. That's how we've taken the Middle East, stripped it. We've taken the Chaco Canyon area, we've stripped it, and we have these impacts. We're taking, taking our urban centers and really making them uninhabitable. What we do is we extract, we mine, we harvest, we manufacture, we create things by you know, heat and treat and beat, and then we just keep moving that forward, and ultimately what happens is you throw it away. And that's what we do with buildings. We throw away. Waste is the big equation. We throw away energy. We just do all kinds of silly things. We build buildings. If you look at this building when you go outside, look at all the trim that's coming apart. As you go through your neighborhood, look at all the siding that's coming apart. Look at all the bad details where buildings literally are rotting down around us. They're disposable buildings. One of the big things you do with a healthy building is you think about crafting that building well so it's sealed up real good. Because what's true is as a building decomposes and starts to fall apart, you get mold, you get mildew, you get bugs, you get all kinds of things, it affects the impact, the air quality, and the wellness of the building. So it's, it's those kind of little things that make a difference. If you don't think it makes a difference, Emory Lovins, uh, you, can, you can go to rmi.org, rockymountaininstitute.org. And Emory is a good friend of mine. He's done a lot of studies on oil use. In fact, he has just written a new book called The Oil Endgame. What's true is if we changed our incandescent bulbs, which is what these are, to the compact fluorescence, we wouldn't have to buy another drop of Middle Eastern oil. If we simply raised our cafe standards by five miles a gallon, we wouldn't have to buy another drop of Middle Eastern oil. If we put awnings on our west and south windows, we could start shutting power plants down in the state of Texas. It's that simple. Where do cows stand out in the field, under the trees? They don't stand out in the sun. You look at our houses and you see all these houses that have these big west windows and big south windows, none of them are shaded. But that impact alone, just putting up shading or planting a deciduous tree on your south and west side, and we wouldn't have to build 16 more coal plants that are going to dump a bunch of garbage into the atmosphere. We could start shutting power plants down. So it comes down to doing little things. So I always like to challenge people at the end of a, a presentation like this, and, and pe because people say, well, geez, where do I start? What do I do? Go buy compact fluorescent bulbs. How many in this room recycle? I would guess just about everybody. Yeah. Recycling is wonderful. When you're walking down the street and you see that crushed aluminum can, pick it up and recycle it. Because every can that you recycle, you can watch television for four hours and not feel a bit of guilt. Because that's how much energy you save by recycling that can. So these little things, if you add them up, can make a huge difference. The amount of things that we throw away are just incredible. And this is the last exercise I want to leave you with in thinking about healthy buildings and things like that. A couple, couple quick scenarios. Um, when we can reduce the amount of energy that we use in our buildings, just go back and think about that power plant. And how much, it's not about, it's, it's saving your pocketbook. And I tell a lot of my clients that. It's, you're going to save a lot of money because you're going to have to pay for utility bills. And they, they're saying, you know, then they come to me and, well, I don't want to be a tree hugger and a green guy and all that kind of thing. And I said, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll save money. And then after they've been in the house for a year and they look at how much money they saved, I pat them on the back and I'll go, by the way, did you realize you're a tree hugger? 
and they don't understand. Like, what are you talking about? Then I tell them how many tons of CO2, NOx, SOx, and so on that they've kept out of the atmosphere by having an energy efficient home. So now this is an exercise thinking about this waste equation. Everybody in here in the next week is going to go shopping. You're going to go somewhere. You're going to go to Fry's. You're going to go to Sears. You're going to go to Target. You're going to go somewhere. When you walk in that door, stop. Stop yourself. Just take a minute. Take a deep breath. Look in that store. Every piece of merchandise in that store. And whatever you buy, hold it in your hand for a moment. And I want you to think about this. When you're holding that radio or an iPod, whatever it is you got in your hand that you buy, and think about the day you're going to throw that away. The day you throw that away, I want you to remember the day that you bought it when you sat there and thought, one day I'm going to have to throw this away. And then when you're confronted with throwing it away, I want you to think about where that's going to go. Because what's true is there is no away. This is a, this is a planet. We're hurtling through space. This is a spaceship. It's called Spaceship Earth. There is no way in this planet. And we need to think about harvesting all these nutrients or designing buildings or iPods in ways that we can reintroduce them in the natural cycle. And as you stand there in that door with that iPod in your hand or that new DVD and you look across that store, think about all that merchandise, all those refrigerators, all those microwaves, all those electronic components, every single thing in that store and realize that that's going to get thrown away. Then think a little bit further and think about how many stores are in your neighborhood that are filled every day with stuff and stuff that gets thrown away. Then think about how many are in the Metroplex. And then think about how many stores globally have that much stuff every day that gets thrown away. It'll scare the hell out of you. Because as a society, that's what we're doing. It doesn't make any sense. And if we can clean up our act in terms of how we build and design the products and services we use, it doesn't mean we have to have a lower quality of life. It means we're going to have a smarter quality of life. And ultimately, the air gets cleaner, the water gets cleaner, and the earth is a happier place to live. Thank you. I don't think any questions about green building. If we've got about 10 minutes for questions? Five? 15 seconds. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, of course. You know, it, it, it's aesthetic. It's all done for aesthetic. It's not done for any other conscious reason. Um, it's a great way to collect water if they collect it, you know, because they could channel the, the rainwater and collect it. In Europe, they're actually doing a lot of things with buildings where they, those pyramidal roofs actually work to create a thermal siphon, and they can use those as an engine to drive natural cooling, to bring cooling in low, and it just runs up through the building. And they use those triangular roofs and, and those sort of roofs as solar engines to drive a solar siphon. But they've got to build two walls. You've got to have a double curtain wall. Europe's just so far ahead of us because energy there costs so much more. So, I mean, we could do it here as well as there. It's just, it's baby steps, just little things that we do pushing the envelope along. I have, what I brought is I brought a brochure about my home. And, uh, and it tells you all the energy efficiency features and environmental features of it uh, with just some real simple diagrams. So that might be, I brought it because I thought some folks may have an interest in it. Sure. I'll give you the, I'll give you the quick 15 second thing on, on tankless water heaters. Tankless water heaters are great. They're wonderful. I have one. The challenge that you're facing is, you know, when you look at the economics of tankless versus tank, a tank's pretty cheap. Tanks is much more expensive. It's cheaper to put a tankless in new construction than it is existing construction because in an existing home you have to get into the stainless steel flue and pipes and, and it often sets the cost off. Now, the federal government has given you almost a $1,000 tax credit now to put in a tankless hot water heater. They're wonderful. If you couple a tankless hot water heater with a solar hot water heater, you can get almost $2,000, and those work really well. Solar hot water heating is, is the simplest thing you can do. The pay baths two and a half years in Texas. It's the greatest place in the world to do solar hot water, and it's ridiculous that we don't do more of it. But the problem you're facing is called, it's, it's what happens when the water lays in the pipe, and you turn on the water, so you're wasting water until that hot water gets there. There's two solutions. Some people put in a recycling loop to keep the hot water in there all the time. And I had a client who listened to a contractor who talked him into putting in a hot water recycling loop. And they called me and they said their electric bills are really high. They were using more cooling than they should. The floor was hot. I went over to the house and sure enough, the floor was hot. And I looked at her and I said, you didn't put in a hot water recycling loop, did you? She said, yeah, the contractor said this is the best thing to do. And I said, you've got a hot, you've got, what you've got is a radiator. So, but what you can do is call a chili pepper pump. You put it right underneath your sink. 
You press the button and it cycles the water in the line, takes a couple of seconds, and then the button will pop up and you've got hot water at the uh, faucet. So those chili pepper pumps are great. Um, they're telling us we've got to cut off so we can, we can walk outside if anybody else has, a, has any other uh, questions about green building. <laughs>